So we're here at Portland Retro Gaming Expo 2018, and I'm here at the Atari Age booth with Al Yarusso, um, the um, what would you say, the president, the owner, the people, the person who owner. runs it. I don't yeah. know about president because I'm the only one really, but owner, yeah. owner. the guy, the guy who runs Atari Age. <laughs> yeah. So, what was your motivation for starting Atari Age? How did it start up? Was it um, like you had a bunch of games that people came to you with, or? You started it first before you, like what was the what was the starting point? So with Atari it? Age actually started, it was the the Atari 2600 Nexus for several years before Atari Age came along. And that site was started by Alex Bilstein, who was another collector who, who lived in Austin, Texas. And uh, one day I bought some, he was he had some games listed on eBay, and I bought the games from him, and I saw that he was in Austin and said, hey, you know, uh, can I come and pick up the games locally from you? And of course, nowadays, when people ask me that, I'm not really fond of that. Yeah, so uh, don't come, don't come yeah, to my yeah, house, exactly. please. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but he said, sure, come on by. So, you know, I went over to his place. We talked and chatted for a bit. Uh, and that's when I learned about the 2600 Nexus. Uh, and then, you know, I started helping him with the site. At the time, his main goal with the site was to, uh, you know, he had created a rarity guide for the 2600. And he was also trying to dump and and release uh, ROMs for games that had not yet been released, like preserve, like preservation yeah, type of thing. Exactly, and emulation was fairly still fairly new back then. This is like you know 1999, 1998, yeah. and uh, and a lot of rare games hadn't been dumped yet, and certainly prototypes were still being discovered all the time. Yeah. So you know he would people would send him games or he'd buy games, he would dump them and post the ROMs on on the Nexus. Uh, and you know he was actively posting news about that sort of thing too. There was a very primitive forum, web forum. It wasn't even a forum back then. <laughs> yeah. But you know, as I helped, was helping with the site over time, we decided, hey, it'd be really cool to make a more organized site that not only covered the 2600 but the 5200, 7800, which is so we started working on Atari Age uh, in 2000 and then launched the site in April 2000, 2001. Uh, and the sections were 2600, 5200, 700 with a much more sophisticated database uh, as well as a, a, a better online forum. And then over time that expanded to include the Jaguar and the Lynx. And we had intended to also do like Atari 8-bit computers and Atari ST, and that hasn't happened. Yeah. And uh, you know, it would still be nice to do that at some point, but I have a lot of work to do on the. the <laughs> we wrote plenty the already. Two thousand, and it definitely needs some big upgrades yeah. versus the store and the forums, which are third-party uh, software that are regularly maintained, updated, and pretty sophisticated. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, so the original goal, you know, was to share information, and we continue to do that with Atari Age. You know, we release prototypes, uh, ROMs all the time, and then the store came along you know, to kind of help pay for the hosting for the site and software costs and things like that. And, you know, it was pretty small and minimal. You know, we brought a few games to Classic Gaming Expo uh, and helped other authors, you know, publish their games. And over time, they just kind of grew. Uh, you know, more people got involved in producing homebrew games for the Atari 2600 and then other systems as well that we were produced games for like 5200, 7800, and then later like the Atari Jaguar. Uh, and then the forums continue to grow, and they're you know they're pretty busy today, obviously. Uh, and we still we have no ads on Atari Age at all. It's all paid for just from the, the sales of show uh, games, uh, as well as forum subscriptions. And that also allows us to come to shows like this, you know, which is you know a pretty a net loss really because we could sell all the games online, and pretty much these people would come to the show but still buy the games. Yeah. Uh, but it's really nice to have a presence at the show like this, especially the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, which I consider probably the premier retro gaming event and you know draws a huge number of people. It's nice to interact with uh, the community as well and to have you know the programmers come in, the developers of the games so that you know the people can have a direct contact with them. Yeah like John Champo is here you know with his uh, new Mappy game and also uh, demoing Wizard of War and he's done you know a lot of other great games in the past. And the Atari alumni are here and you know a lot of great talks you know it's on the west coast so it's easy for them to get to. Uh, but, you know, there's a huge number of people here, and we're right at the main door, you know, so we get a lot of traffic coming in, people playing homebrews. A lot of people are introduced to homebrew games for the first time here. They have no idea what these games are. It's like, I don't recognize any of these games. Did and, this and came out? I don't yeah, remember this had, coming out. I had someone come up to our table early and said, wow, your boxes, your boxes are all in pristine condition. <laughs> and, you know, it took me a moment to realize he thinks these are old games. They're just, you know, perfectly preserved. I They're so know. shiny. Yeah, these are brand new games. You know, yeah. and so the boxes are brand new. You know, some of these were just got a few days ago. Yeah. Uh, I've heard more than one person come up and go, oh, wow. Yeah. Like, they're so impressed 
with the quality of the yeah. homebrew that's coming out now. Yeah, the games themselves, I mean, just phenomenal what people are able to do and the packaging and everything, which you couldn't do this 20 years ago. Because printing technology has improved to the point where it's much easier to get shorter runs of high quality boxes, manuals, and labels. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the sharing of knowledge that the internet allows and the quality of the emulators and the development tools and flash carts and everything else, yeah. uh, that makes it easier for people to develop games. Com compared to years ago, like when Atari, you know, back in the day, where companies are very secretive about how to develop, especially Atari, they didn't want third parties developing games. So, uh, you know, Activision, of course. Up to a lawsuit, yeah. yeah. And fortunately, Atari lost that lawsuit. Fortunately, we yeah. Have the third party software movement that we have now, I mean, things are probably totally different if Atari had won that lawsuit. Uh, so, you know, it just progressed over years and, and time, and, you know, to a really fairly large homebrew development team for not just the Atari systems, but, you know, pretty much everything. You know, not modern consoles, obviously, which require huge teams to develop. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's a, a, a blossoming homebrew scene all around, and you know, for the 2600 is 40 years old. Yeah, you know? 41 now. Yeah, it's and just we've, we've probably published over 100 games now, just for the 2600 wow. in uh, in almost well, not about 15 years. So yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of crazy, and we we like to continue making the games available, not just do a limited run. So those games, you know, as they get added to the store, continue to be available. So the very it just gets bigger game, and bigger. Yeah, we have old games like Thrust Plus Platinum by Thomas Yentz are still popular, and you know, still play really, really well, even though it's you know it's getting older, uh, and people still buy them as because people are always coming to the scene for the first time today. So it's kind of a crime if you you know they can't get those older games. Yeah. So yeah, it's always sad when I want to buy. I hear of a game that was that came out five ten years ago, and I want to buy it on cartridge but it was only a limited run for 40, 50, 100, or the person developing it is no longer developing it, they're not around, so it's really nice to have a huge catalog to choose from. Yeah, I agree, and that, you know, it's, while we may not sell many of those older games, people do still buy them. You know, there's always, of course, a big sales surge of new games when they come out, but it's nice when someone can come along and, and, and say, oh yeah, I, you know, I don't have this game, or I've never heard of this game, and then you know, you maybe download the ROM and try it out, or see a YouTube video, and people make lists of their favorite homebrews, which often includes older games like Ladybug or, or Thrust Plus Platinum and things like that, and then they can still get them. Yeah, the age of the game when it came out really has no bearing on, on the fun that you get out of it. Yeah, so I mean, some people like to move on. They'll do a project, maybe do a couple hundred. You know, they may print boxes for a couple hundred, and once they exhaust those boxes, that's it, and then they want to move on to the next project. Uh, and for us, it's you know we try to juggle all the new stuff as well as the old games, so people can still get them. And that includes sometimes reprinting boxes for games. Uh, but then a lot of the older games only have bo uh, carts and manuals, and that's fine with people. You know they, they really want to play the game. And yeah. The box doesn't matter. And, and I agree, the box is a nice CD, but certainly not necessary. Yeah, and, that, and that's where the, you do have some sort of a limit yeah. to. Yeah, the boxes disappear. So I always make sure I buy it immediately. <laughs> it's like yeah, that box know. is going away yeah, possibly. If, if a game doesn't do really well. And you know we we have the boxes for, for a long time. Yeah. Once it, once we sell out of the boxes, there's not as much of an incentive to, to get more printed. So yeah. that, that's a good idea on your yeah. part. Um, so t take us through the steps from when you get a ROM and maybe the artwork, I guess, and take us through the steps of putting out a game from those early things. It's like okay, you get the basics of it, and take us through to when you actually can sell it and. So a lot, a lot of times, you know, someone will post a demo of a ROM, or they'll contact me directly and say, "Hey, you know, I'm working on this game. Uh, you know, I'd love to have it available in the Atari Age store. Uh, you know, what's the process involved in that?" And you know, the first thing I'll do is, you know, I want to play the game, and uh, you know, it's something that I think is, is suitable for the Atari Age store. And a lot of times, I'll give the author feedback, uh, depending on what stage they are in development. If they're really early on, they're still kind of just you know doing what they want to do with the game. But as it gets further developed, you know, I'll, I'll get feedback, and, I'll, and usually I'll have other people playing it too. Some of them will post the ROMs publicly. In fact, quite a few of them, especially with the 2600. Yeah, because some just come out of nowhere, yeah, some, and it's like, whoa, I'd never even heard of this, and, and now fun. it's available. And that, you know, that is fun because a lot of people, most of the people actually do post them and get feedback. Sometimes help from other authors, more experienced authors maybe. But sometimes people will develop a game, start from finish. And then poof, here's a ROM that no one even, or a game that here no, no one even knew about before. Yeah, the, the, the sheep game, the sheep it up, like, it's yeah, like, exactly. where, where did this come from? Yeah. I, and that's an example of someone who wrote me out of the blue and said, hey, I wrote this game, I've written it on another platform first, would you be interested in publishing it? Uh, and, 
you know, I played it and said, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty cool game. It's a fairly simple game, but it's still, you know, addictive and fun. You want to try to get higher and higher, yeah. which, you know, a lot of the original Atari games are the same way. Pretty simple, but they're addictive games. Yes, exactly. You just want to keep pressing yourself to see how high you can get. So in the case of, uh, of Cheap It Up, yeah. the author contacted me and said, uh, hey, you know, I've written this game uh, for the 2600. You know, do you want to take a look at it? And is it something you'd be interested in publishing? And so I, I played it. I thought it was fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wrote it back, sure. You know, and uh, then told, you know, asked if we had any artwork uh, for the label because right. for the boxes, labels, and manuals, uh, you know, you generally have artwork that is shared between the three of them. Yeah. And then you, you know, labels pretty simple usually, and there's two labels. The box is the next com more complicated thing because it's got you know six sides. And then the manuals are the most complex aspect because depending on the complexity of the game, the manuals can be pretty long. Anywhere from four to 16 or even longer. Like the Defender of the Crown manual we did for the Atari Jaguar, we completely redid it from scratch and it's 32 pages, which is one of the longest manuals. Haunted Adventure Trilogy, which is a like, collection of three hacks, haunted, you know, haunted hacks, or three different games, all, uh, all collected together. And that's got a pretty extensive manual. But most of them are shorter, but still they're, you know, it's a lot of work to do the manuals, and that's usually the last thing to get done. And uh, would would you help with that, um, getting them, you know, I guess templates or referring them to somebody who knows how to make a, a manual? Or? Usually, we end up doing it ourselves. And uh, as far as you know, we work, we worked with a lot of artists and designers over the years. Uh, so you know, if there's a new project, uh, you know, I'll probably like shop it around to different people and say, hey, would you be interested in working on this project? Uh, and sometimes there'll be a, a separate artist and then a designer who'll do the layout for the for the, like the box and the manual. Uh, you know, it can be several people involved. There might even be a fourth, you know, three or four people involved doing stuff like that. And then there might be a pixel artist working on the game as well. It's, uh, it's quite a collaborative effort yeah, for yeah. a lot of these games. They have a sound, a sound person, a graphics yeah, yeah. person, a coder, and then they get help from the forums for help yeah. with their code. So yeah, it's definitely a collaborative effort in many places. In places, sometimes people will do everything themselves, including the artwork and the manual. But that was the case with uh, Sheep It Up. Uh, Dr. Ludos did the, the game and then he created the label and the manual. We didn't do a box for that game, uh, so just a label and manual. Uh, and then, you know, he had pretty much already delivered a finished game. You know, I, I gave him some feedback. I don't even know if it, I don't even know if, I think at that point it was probably pretty much finished. Uh, and then, you know, we, we printed the boxes, I mean not the boxes, sorry, the labels and manuals along with a whole bunch of other games that we released at, at PRG. Uh, and which happens a lot, which helps reduce the cost a little bit when you can get a large hatch run of the labels and manuals, especially when they're all the same size. You know, the printing, may, you know, they have to load up different files for the press, but the finishing work, like cutting uh, and folding and, and all that for the box, our uh, manuals are the same, and box the same thing. They're using the same die to do all the boxes, so it's helpful to do a whole bunch at once. Yeah, I've noticed you do it in batches, usually before PRGE or, or maybe another convention, so that's a lot of work to do. Yeah. all at once. It's yeah. quite overwhelming. And getting ready for the show as well and transporting everything. Yeah, that's a minor understatement. <laughs> and it's not really my goal to release a ton of games at one show, in this yeah. case, like 10 for PRG. Yeah. You're often managing a whole bunch of projects, yeah. you know, all, almost all of them with different people involved. Yes. And you're trying to get everything together by certain deadlines, and those deadlines are different for the labels, manuals, and, and uh, boxes, which are printed by different companies. So and you're getting emails from all over the place oh, yeah. and coordinating tons of people. Yeah, there's a lot of emails, uh, private messages. Some people communicate on Facebook. So, you know, you got to keep track of all that. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of testing the games. You know, i got to make sure there are no issues with the games running on the actual hardware on the systems yeah. versus emulation, which is what a lot of people use to test. Yeah, no screen jumping. That's what I encounter on my show as well. It's like, oh, it runs fine on Stella. Exactly. But once you put it into an actual system, it's like flipping. Yeah, and a lot, so it's really important. What, what a lot of people do is test on Stella or whatever emulator they're using on a system yeah. and then periodically test on a flash car on the system to make sure there's no issues. And the earlier they do that, the better. Because you really don't want to find show-stopping bugs at the last minute as you're trying to press towards the show. My goal really is to have smaller batches of releases, like maybe two or three games at a time, you know, spread out throughout the year. And I was hoping to do that this year. Like last year, we actually had, you know, we released some games in June and then more at PRG. And I really like to try to do that maybe once a quarter. And it also helps for the people buying the games too, because it's like, ouch, my wallet, Not right? that. Yeah, that too, but also, uh, the, the attention is spread across more games and as opposed to just a couple games that you know where people can focus on them better so some games might get lost in that shuffle of you know 10 games at once even though they are for different systems like we had 2650 2700 and Jaguar released at this show so that's not yes. too bad but yeah, some quite a few Jaguar yeah some people do like 
you know, all those systems. And yeah. you know, so the ouch my wallet definitely comes into play. And do you, do you spread out genres too? Like, oh, we have three platformers, oh, we have three shooters. Usually they're different. Yeah. Uh, it's not that often where you've got two really similar games. Like a Sheep It Up and, and uh, yeah. uh, Jumper. a Jumper Jump are very similar in yeah. concept, but they're not going to be released at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I know Amoeba Jump was really close, and I'm like, I saw yeah. Sheep, Sheep It Up, and I'm like, oh, oh, there's trouble here. Yeah, someone even had asked me, is that like an, an Amoeba you know, Jump type game? And, uh, and that was before I had really played Amoeba Jump, and, and so I kind of chuckled after that when I saw that. Uh, but, you know, he's done a great job with that also, and it's a fun game, and I know people have been enjoying it here. But, yeah, that'll be, but, you know, the artwork and stuff, that hasn't even been started for, the, for Amoeba Jump for the manual. So that'll take a little time, so that'll come out probably early next year. So, but again, I want to try to do smaller uh, batches of release. And it's also easier on me, because oh, yeah. now I've got it, when I get back from Portland, I need to try to get these new games into the store in November so people can order them in time for Christmas. And of course, I'll get a large uh, batch of orders and then have to get all those games built and, uh, and shipped you know, in time for people to receive them at Christmas. So I really won't get to relax until sometime in January, which would be nice. So, and it just then, never ends, right? And then I can, yeah, and then I can continue working on more games. You know, maybe you know, sometime in the spring, get those games out. That's that's the plan. Yeah. Well, I, and I have to upgrade the forum and the store, so I have a lot of software-related work too, plus the main site. So, but that's not going to happen until January. But hopefully, I can focus on that then. So maybe step me through um, the process of actually getting the ROM and getting the shells. Like, where do you get the cartridge shells? I know you had a, a trade-in program for store credit at one point and getting them into the cartridge and, and the different types of boards that you have. Sure. Uh, for the longest time, we were actually recycling old Atari 2600 shells, uh, common games mainly, you know, things Which like Which ones are you sick of seeing? Well, well, I'm, I'm not really sick of seeing them, but Pac-Man, for whatever reason, the Pac-Man cartridges have the most difficult labels to remove. So I try to avoid those. But you know, Combat and Asteroid, Space Invaders, Defender, you know, all those older games, you know, Combat would be one of the more popular ones. And of course, there are a million Pac-Mans out there. Yeah. And uh, you know, you can't really sacrifice ET anymore. It's very you know, precious. It's I worth know. a lot, especially if it has dirt on it. And then, and Adventure because of Ready Player One oh, is another yeah. one. But more recently, we're using new cartridge shells for those. But when it, what we were recycling, you've got like use a heat gun okay. to get the label off the cart, and then use something like Goo Gone to get the glue residue off the cart because you want a perfectly smooth. Uh, label surface. Otherwise, when you put the labels down, you're going to get imperfections underneath the label. Bubbling and stuff like that. Like, like even a little dust particle or something will show up underneath the label, and you don't want that. Uh, and then uh, the cartridge or the boards, the circuit boards. There's several different types of circuit boards, like for 4K games, uh, and then bank switch boards, for like 8K, 16K, 32K, 64K games, and then melody boards, which are more sophisticated. They have an ARM processor on them used for Mappy and Space Rock, Stay Frosty 2, Scramble, Super Cobra Arcade, Epic Adventure, and uh, uh, Shattery, and a few others. Uh, and those are more advanced, and like, the program has really pushed the Atari 2600, but those are also pretty expensive boards, which is why the price of those games is higher. Yeah. And we also have an Area board, A-R-I-A, which is a, a simpler version of a kind of a melody. It uses uh, a, 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 a less expensive, less capable ARM chip, and we just use that for the uh, bank switching capabilities. You know, the programmers aren't running code on that one like they are on the ARM, but that one's also nice because it's a flash reprogrammable cartridge uh, or board, so we can actually uh, reprogram the board if need be with the game, in the, with the board in the cartridge, same as the melody boards. Like we've had last year a bit of a, bit of a crazy mess with uh, Draconian and Super Cobra Arcade because the bug was found in the new CDF driver, which is the driver used to drive the ARM chip and then what you're writing your code against, which is previously DPC Plus based on like uh, David Crane's DPC. Pitfall 2. Yeah, from Pitfall 2. So, uh, you know, like a week before the show, while I was doing a lot of testing, I had a whole bunch of 2600s and a whole bunch of 7800s out, and I was testing the games. And we found that it wasn't running on some, like the games wouldn't boot up on a few 7800 systems and some 2600s. Yeah. So there's kind of a scramble then with all the people involved to try to fix this issue. Yeah. And I, uh, so what ended up happening is I built all the carts, labeled all the carts uh, for PRG last year. And then when we got here, like while I was driving from Austin, Texas up to Portland, uh, they managed to figure out the problem. Like, you know, just basically like the day before I arrived. 
Uh, so what we did, and this is what the, 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 the plan was if they actually fixed it, was we reprogrammed all those cartridges. And be, you know, because they're melody games, it, it's not too hard to do, but it's still time consuming. Were the labels on them already? Yes, we've already labeled. So you can reprogram them in circuit. You can, you can actually uh, open up the dust cover and then plug a pro like a, another edge connector into it. Uh, and then that's connected via USB to the computer, and then we can reflash the software, basically using the Harmony card software, because they're based, they're, the Melody board and the Harmony card are pretty much the same thing, except there's no SD card, yep. and there's no USB uh, interface on it. Yeah, so that's what the little uh, the programmer is. It basically has that additional hardware that's normally on the Melody, I mean the Harmony card. Yeah. So yeah, we reprogrammed all those, and we still have to box all the games up, because uh, okay. it was just the cartridges. So they still have to be put into the boxes with the manual, with the box insert, and the cartridge. And we were up until probably around 2 a.m. Friday night, the day before the show, and I had to get up, you know, three or four hours after that to actually get here. Yeah. So that was kind of crazy. Fortunately, we didn't have to do that this year with anything. We still <laughs> built quite a few games, hundreds of games, yeah. into uh, boxes, yeah. uh, but we just don't like building the games in the boxes uh, and bringing them here because they can get damaged. Right. Uh, even just sitting in a truck in a, in a box. Yeah, so you have all them all flat. Yeah. So all the boxes are flat, so they were, you know, glued and, and built, and uh, and then. You know, we had all, all the manuals and carts already done, so it's just a matter of assembling everything together. And with a bunch of people, that goes pretty quickly. But we get here a day early. We get here Thursday, and then use that time Thursday and Friday to set up the booth and do and, you know any last game, minute game assembly that needs to be done. Uh, and just you know, it's a pretty big booth, so there's a lot to it with all the systems and the banners and the TVs and and everything else to get ready. The demo carts and the placards and just all that. So, but it all came together, and uh, and it looked always looks great. Especially all the banners. Thank you. Yeah, the banners. The banners are always fun to do too. I have a huge collection of banners. I need to sell them someday. Oh, some please. Rockers want them too. Uh, yeah, they, they would get first dibs, obviously. Yeah. But some I have doubles of, like Mappies. There's a banner out there, and then there's the banner on the back wall. So, but yeah, I do. You know, I've cataloged all of them, and uh, actually need to list them at some point because they're starting to take up room. And I bet. And they're four foot by two and a half feet, and they look pretty nice on a wall. Yeah, not I'll probably, small. I'll probably frame a couple of them myself. So. So do you remember which game you uh, released first under the Atari Age banner, or which, which first couple games? Uh, yes, uh, Thrust Plus, and I almost said Thrust Plus Platinum, but <laughs> Thrust Plus and uh, with a driving controller, uh, and that was one of the first games. And it had already been released by another publisher, but I was able to buy basically an entire pa a pallet of these driving foot pedal controllers, rather. Oh, wow. Not driving controllers, foot pedal controller. And you could use a foot pedal controller, I think, along with a driving controller uh, uh, to control the game. Uh, the foot pedal had multiple pedals on it. And I, I imported into the US a whole pallet of these. I had to go to the airport to, uh, air, I can't remember the name, of the, uh, the name of the company where I had to pick them up, you know, and custom inspect them. And, uh, and then, you know, drag, you know, basically then put all the individual boxes into the car because I couldn't take the whole pallet. Oh, yeah. uh, once, but they all did, and then we brought them and sold them like that. And uh, Berserk Voice Enhance was another one by Mike Micah, yeah. uh, you know, the hack of Berserk. That, uh, so some really interesting first games yeah. that had like some differences to them than the, than the average game. Yeah, so yeah, Berserk was a hack, but it added the voice to Berserk. Uh, and then, you know, he, Mike Micah, so we allowed him to sell it from our booth at Classic Game Expo eons ago. I don't remember which year, it was 2001 or 2002. And then later we added that to the store. So those are two of the first ones right there. And then from there, we just, you know, some of the, uh, the Zype, the XYPE, some of the authors had kind of formed a little coalition uh, to produce games. So like Gunfight uh, was one, and then uh, QB. Uh, but anyway, some of those early games by those guys. And again, some of them had previously been published, and, uh, you know, we published them. And later on, we started getting the games that hadn't been published yet by anybody. Uh, and then publishing them under the Atari Age label first. And and do you try and, and keep the games exclusive, or is it... Because I know some other places do publish yeah. some of the games, and, and they have different labels and stuff, and do you try and have an exclusivity, or is it just... It really, it really depends. Uh, that hasn't come up too often, uh, because people, uh, a lot of publishers like the way we do the, the manuals and labels and, and boxes, and they understand that there's a big investment in doing, especially the boxes, doing all that. And, uh, and the Atari H store at this point is, is, is pretty good visibility. And it's, you know, it's a pretty professional store as well. Uh, and then you know, they, a lot of the authors use the Atari H forums uh, you know, to, to help 
uh, develop their games. And so, you know, we've got private development forums too for some of the publishers or some of the, the like. So they can talk amongst themselves without prying eyes and knowing what's going on. Yeah. And, uh, and so they appreciate that as well. So, you know, they kind of like to support Atari Age as well by, by allowing Atari Age to publish their games. Uh, but sometimes, you know, there are, you know, their, their game will be published by multiple publishers. Uh, but that's less common these days. Yeah. So. So you cover Jaguar, um, 2600, 7800, 5200. Um, are you going to get into the Atari computer line? I know you have in the past because I looked up and you did a Satan's Hollow at one point. Well, for, oh yeah, those are pretty old. Yeah, those were, man, that's that's early in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, there were a few Atari 8-bit games like that. There were prototypes of games that had never been released generally. And yeah, we had someone design some labels in the style of the original brown labels that Atari did, and printed up that in a nice color laser, and they came out really nice. And you know, you could barely differentiate them from the original labels. So yeah, there were probably ten different games, including Satan's Hollow, but those are reproductions. Uh, however, we have uh, released there so far just two: Castle Crisis and uh, Beef Drop for the Atari 8-bit. Uh, but we'll be doing Scramble uh, because there's a 5200 version of that from Playsoft, which they wrote from scratch, which looks great. And is over there. We have that playing here at the show. And then uh, he's put together an Atari 8 version of that as well. And then Atari Boy 2600 on the forum has created a ton of great labels for games over the years, mostly for reproductions on the 5200. I mean, he's just churning them out, but he's done a few labels for us for the 2600. So we created great art, art, artwork for that. We're still going to probably do a box and, and manual for that, for the 5200 and the Atari 8 bit. Adventure 2, which was a 5200 release, uh, the author, Ron Lloyd, has uh, also created a version now for the Atari 8-bit computers called Adventure 2 XE. Yep. It's, you know, instead of 32K, it's 64K, so it's a bit larger. And, uh, and you know, he's added some additional uh, functionality and, and, and features to that. We showed it last year at the show, but we just need to get that finished and released. Uh, and then, there, you know, there's, there's tons of Atari 8-bit uh, homebrews, and I'd like to contact some other of those authors and publishers and see if they'd be interested in having them in the Atari store because my first computer was an Atari 800 XL. Right. Uh, you know, I did a lot of programming on them over the years. I uh, ran BBSs on them, and uh, you know, so they're they're dear to my heart, and you know, definitely need more attention in the store. So. Well, thank you so much for uh, providing the interview, and uh, yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. And thanks for all the work you're doing, uh, doing all the reviews that you do, and and the, you know, the playthroughs of games. Uh, on YouTube and drawing more attention to the homebrewers. Oh, no problem, man. Without you guys, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it, and without the, the developers. So it's it's a wonderful community. I'm, and I'm so glad that, you know, you're providing that hub with the forums and everything like that. And I'm glad you're enjoying it. So it's great. So thank you so much. You're welcome.